for tonight's talk, well, I've known Emma for over 10 years now. We used to work together in the cemetery. And um, I thought she was amazing then. And she's a working mum with all sorts of hobbies and tenacious research skill. Um, and we were working on the World War I project at that time. And, and uh, she just kept doing anything. Um, and then I only found one thought that she doesn't like people for this. So working in the cemetery uh, <laughs> was not something that she was really keen on. But, but she's still doing it, so <laughs> not with me, sadly. Um, I'm going to let her introduce the talk and tell you. I, I'd just like to say, if my husband had introduced me, I definitely have more than one floor, for sure. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is, I, I, I lived off Mill Road next to the cemetery for 20 years, and I'm now living next to another cemetery. <laughs> so I can only live next to places with cemeteries, clearly. So there we are. Uh, thank you to Mill Road History Society for inviting me to give you a talk to you about Richarda Morrow Tate, known as Dickie the first woman to fly around the world in 1949. 2024 is the 75th anniversary of her flight around the world. But did any of you know her name? Did you know that she came from Cambridge? I don't know. I mean, I have come across people that have heard of her, but not many. She was a pioneer and adventurer. She was the first woman to earn her civilian flying license after the end of the Second World War. And aged just 24 years old, she started her round-the-world flight with only 80 hours flying experience. What was supposed to take six to eight weeks turned into a journey lasting one year and one day. It involved a major crash, which gives you an indication that there were minor crashes as well, and two airplanes. So first of all, let me outline how I'm going to cover this talk. So if we move on to, oh, we've moved on to the next slide. Uh, introduction, I'll briefly introduce myself again. We'll go on to how I rediscovered Richarda. Uh, then we'll move on to the Blue Plaque campaign. Richarda's story itself, which I'm assuming is why you're here to learn about her. What next after that? And at the end, we've got the usual questions. Do keep a, an, an eye on what questions you might want to ask at the end, but I'm happy to ask questions as we go along as well, so just stop me and I'll answer them. So my introduction. My name is Emma Easterbrook, as you've heard. I grew up in and around Cambridge, including nearly 20 years off Mill Road, and for some of that time I was chair of the Friends of Mill Road Cemetery. I've recently moved to Ickleton, a village to the south of Cambridge, and in fact, I grew up on either side of that village in Great Chesterford and Whittlesford. I was educated at the Perth School for Girls, which is now the Stephen Perth, Cambridge, and also Trinity College, Cambridge, and I've worked for Clare College, Cambridge. So in my eyes, I'm both town and gown, but I'm always town first, I'd just like to say. I should also say that I'm not a pilot, so if you do have any technical questions at the end, I was going to say I'll take them away and come back to you, but there is actually someone in the audience who is a pilot, so I will be looking to him to help me out if you have anything tricky about uh, flying. Moving on to rediscovering Richarda. How did I find out about her? How did I come across her? Why am I here? So you may feel that my introduction was a random series of facts or events, but for those of you that joined the previous talk given for Mill Road History Society by Joanna Hudson on her campaign for a blue plaque for George Brewster, the young chimney sweep, you will know that a random series of facts or, or events was precisely what intrigued her and inspired her to rediscover and investigate George's story. I'm now going to tell you about how it is that my random series of facts or events, including what I spoke to you about in my introduction, caused me to rediscover Richarda Moritate and her story. So bear with me, and like all good stories, thanks have to go to very many people along the journey back in time. So the very first person I want to thank is someone I haven't met, but I have heard a lot about over the years, and I'm sure you have too. And that is Mike Petty, MBE, writer, broadcaster, local historian, 
and formerly local studies librarian at the Cambridge Central Library. And the main reason why we now have such a comprehensive collection of resources for our area called the Cambridgeshire Collection. He regularly posts on the Cambridgeshire History and Fenland History Facebook pages. And his posts, as some of you may have seen, often look back at historic newspaper articles on Cambridge. On the 16th of June 2017, Mike posted his research on some flats on Chesterton Road in Cambridge called St Regis. And I don't know if any of you saw St Regis before the new building was put up. Um, anyway, this article started with a, uh, a look back at the Cambridge Daily News on the 6th of April 1939, advertising them for rent, which was just after those flats were first built. And as you can see on the screen, you can see the original St Regis flats, which I remember going past growing up and always wondering, they always look quite nice. You know, I love Poirot and it looks like 1930s Poirot all over. So I, I really wanted to go and have a look at them, but I, I, I didn't at that stage. And this is the original advert, as, as I said, that Mike posted back in 2017. Now, remember what they look like, because I'm going to show you a photo shortly about what they look like now. Anyway, Mike went on in his post to talk about not only what the St Regis flats were used for over the years, but he also touched on some of the residents. One of them was Richarda Morrow Tate, and he described her being interviewed at her home in St Regis after she had completed the round the world trip in 1949. Now, before she made that trip, I also saw that there'd been a photo shoot. So she started off on the um, 18th of August, 1948. And a few days before that, on the 15th of August, 1948, she was on top of the flats having a photo shoot. And if you search top photo with an F, you can see some of the photos from that photo shoot on the top of St. Regis. So I, I recommend going to have a look at those photos. I didn't see Mike's Facebook post back in 2017. And if only I had done so, I would have been straight down to those flats to take comprehensive photos. Because as it happened, I had just taken over line management of accommodation at Clare College, which included St. Regis but I didn't, and I didn't know. So um, I'm sure there are photos out there, and I just need to track them down. It's on my list to do. As it was, as I said, I didn't see that original post in 2017, but did, Mike did post a second Facebook post on St Regis, and that was on the 19th of August, 2020. So on the, on the day that she flew back, the, the anniversary of the day that she flew back, and that was from the Cambridgeshire Daily News on the 19th of August, 1948. That was the article that he posted. And that's when I became aware of her story. I then did some research and found his earlier post. So I was already digging around at that point. The reason I saw that second post was because it was posted by a local academic who'd picked up on Mike Petty's post and was also interested in the story of Richarda and the fact that she came from Cambridge as well. She happens to be married to a Cambridge Clare College fellow. And so there was that, again, that inter interconnection between the two, two worlds. Um, I commented on that friends page and I went back to have a look at what I posted before I came to do this talk. And I put, is that of St. Regis, Chesterton Road, now owned by Clare College? Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. So, you know, I was very excited. Um, and you can see that's the second post from Mike Petty. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see what's written under there, but essentially that's a throwback picture. The, the, the article itself uh, came out a little bit later from this, this photo um, when she crash landed in Alaska. But this is on the day that she started flying from Marshall's Airfield from the Cambridge Aero Club. And she's there with her first husband, Norman Morrow Tate, and their 22-month-old daughter, Anna, as well. And there's no one there at the airfield at Cambridge. Uh, she then goes on to do the formal start from Croydon, and it was absolutely packed with press photographers. So as I said, Mike's posts obviously intrigued me, and if you search for Mike Petty, Richard Morrow Tate, St Regis Facebook on Google, 
you can find that first post and read all about the history of the St. Regis flats in more detail, including what they were used for once they were no longer flats and before they became Clare College accommodation. However, it was Richarda who stood out for me in that post, not only because she was the first woman to fly around the world, which was such an astonishing achievement, but also because I had never heard of her. I mean, I've heard of Amy Johnson, I've heard of Amelia Earhart, uh, as I'm sure you do, um, but I'd never heard of her name. So at that point, I decided to do some light research on her to find out a little bit more. And I also spoke to Clare College's estates director, and she in turn asked me if I could find some photos on her uh, to incorporate them into the decor for the new Clare St Regis flats, given her connection to the history of the site. And as I said, I would have been straight down to St Regis if I'd known, but I didn't. And when I first saw that second post in 2020, you can hear where I'm going with this, um, the St Regis flats had been demolished and new accommodation was in the process of being built in their place. Now, as it happened, I did have a chance to look round St Regis before they were demolished, but at the time, as I said, I didn't know about Richarda. I did take some photos, but not a huge number of photos. It was just really for, sort of for memento's sake. I wasn't able to find them before I came to this talk, but honestly, it would have been just of Urkel furniture and, and sort of dingy corridors, so I'm <laughs> not sure that it would be much interest. So I had to shelve that initial idea from the estates director about finding those photographs, A, because there was nothing to put them in at the time, and um, secondly, as you probably worked out, it was COVID-19 had just hit the UK, and I had other things on my plate at the time, as I'm sure you did too. So if we move on to the next slide, this is the photo of the new Clare St Regis, and you can see Clare College is across there, and you've got the Clare College coats of arms as well, um, the obligatory student bicycles, etc. And you can see I went, went out and <laughs> took a photo just before this talk for you. Um, it, this was designed by Freeland Rees Roberts Architects and the building project actually won two Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors Awards in 2022. So it, it's very sad to say goodbye to the, the previous flats, but they were in very, very poor disrepair and they've been turned into brand new accommodation for students and there is some commercial lettings behind it as well. So moving on to the blue plaque campaign, and again, the second person I would like to thank is Joanna Hudson, who I mentioned at the start of this talk. She is the reason why I decided to campaign for a blue plaque for Richard de Morrow Tate. As I said, I was the chair of the Friends of Mill Road Cemetery, but I was also a member of the history subcommittee and also the secretary in between as well. Back in 2019, an inquiry arrived for the Friends of Mill Road Cemetery from Joanna Hudson, asking for help to find the location of George Brewster's burial in the cemetery. And as I said, some of you will know that George Brewster was the young chimney sweep that died in the Fullbourne Asylum whilst going up a chimney. And his death prompted Lord Shaftesbury to uh, look into child, changing child labour laws across the country. So he was the catalyst for that. So Joanna's email came in on the 14th of September 2019, which I again looked back at before I came to this talk. Um, it was one of many inquiries that are always coming into the Friends. Uh, and to be honest, I, I didn't take much notice of it at the time because it was one of many, many inquiries coming in at the time. And the lovely Mary Naylor, who introduced me, and Caro Wilson, who's not here tonight uh, from the History Subcommittee as well, uh, took on the inquiry to find out a little bit more about George for Joanna. They were able to locate the grave, it's unmarked. Uh, he was buried in, a, in one of a, a plot for many people. And they also obtained permission from the Parochial Burial Grounds Management Committee, also known as the Parishes Committee, uh, so that they could clear the area. Not only so Joanna could visit it, but for any of us to go and visit it and, and pay our respects and to learn a bit more about George Brewster's story. So that's why I, as I said, wanted to look at getting a blue plaque for Richarda. I just hadn't thought about it at the time until Joanna popped up. But as I said, also the COVID-19 pandemic had hit the UK in early 2020 
And also, I didn't want to cross over with her campaign. I, I wanted her campaign to run before I started mine uh, so that we wouldn't be competing for funding. Nevertheless, I still approached Clare College just to raise the idea and to see what they thought about it. And they were very happy to approve the idea of a blue pack. And so once we started to emerge from the pandemic in 2021, I approached Cambridge Past, Present and Future, which you may know is the local charity which manages the blue plaque scheme within Cambridge City and South Cambridgeshire in August 2021. And on 16th of September 2021, the Cambridge PPF committee gave the go ahead for Richarda's blue plaque. But then the cost of living crisis hit. And I really felt that in the circumstances, it wasn't a good idea to start fundraising at that stage. I didn't feel I could approach people when everyone had bigger things on their plate again. So there was a question from the previous talk. I don't know if that person is here. Um, they asked how many blue plaques are awarded within Cambridge every year. I don't know the answer to that question, but I have looked at the Cambridge PPF website. There are currently 41 plaques listed on their website, and I know of at least four current campaigns, including the one that I'm talking about tonight. So a little fact for you. And I, again, I recommend going on the website. It's really interesting to read about all the blue plaques. I really think that someone ought to create a trail for the blue plaques so we can go on a wander, a bit like the Dinky Doors. If you've, you've ever been on a Dinky Doors walk, I, I certainly have. Um, so whilst preparing for this campaign, I thought it was only right that, it, that I should try and trace the family and tell them about what I was doing. Like many of you, again, uh, I used the genealogy website Ancestry UK. I built up a family tree. I'm not going to show it because we've got living descendants on it. Um, and I was able to then track down Richarda's granddaughter. And from her, she put me in touch with Richarda's daughter and son-in-law. So the little girl that you saw earlier in the slide and also Richarda's son. Um, very sadly, in February 2023, Richarda's daughter died unexpectedly. And I have to say, it was at that point I thought, I can't wait any longer. I am going to have to start fundraising. Uh, it's, it's very sad that her, her daughter has died and is not going to be able to see the blue plaque, but at least she knew about the campaign. And I spoke to the family and they felt the same way as well. So on the 10th of March last year, uh, I launched the blue plaque. Now, as you may know, Cambridge PPF, in line with the majority, if not all charities, don't like to officially run a campaign unless we know already that there is some money forthcoming or it has been promised, because you don't want to have the campaign up with a zero at the bottom. It's not very inspiring for people. Um, so I spoke to an, a number of people and very kindly, the family came forward to cover the majority of the blue plaque. We also had some private donations and the shortfall was covered by Clare College. So I had thought I'd be approaching 1400 people and asking each and every one of them for one pound and I would raise it that way. I'm sure I do know 1400 people, but obviously it'd be a lot of talking to get that one pound off everyone. Anyway, so what I thought was going to be the hardest part of the campaign, the fundraising for the 1400 pounds, and that's what it takes to install and celebrate and create a blue plaque, that was done within days. Um, so yes, that was a bit of a surprise to me, I have to say. Now, as you know, the 2024 is going to be the 75th anniversary of the completion of Richard and Morrow's flight around the world. And I had already, as well as contacting the family, started considering and approaching various institutions with connection to Richard and Morrow Tate as to whether they would host the ceremony. Because you don't normally host the ceremony at the place that you're going to put it up. You can host it anywhere that has a connection to the person. So I spoke to Duxford Imperial War Museum, which happens to be a second point for the Cambridge Aero Club where she learned to fly. And obviously it's a very historical place. It's quite close to where she grew up as well. I contacted her school at the Perth School for Girls as it then was, the, per the Stephen Perth Cambridge as it now is. And they're very enthusiastic about it. 
The Ickleton Society, which is the local history, history society, incredibly active history society. I, I recommend looking at their, their website as well. Huge amounts of photographs and documents, etc. Lots of talks as well. And also the Cambridge Aero Club associations. And I've been talking to Terry Holloway, the former managing director there, uh, who has a huge enthusiasm and in fact was one of the few people that had heard of Richarda and had been talking about her throughout his life to promote flying to women in particular. So there are a lot of women pilots out there who may have been inspired by Richarda Morotate, including Carol Vorderman. So if you search for Carol Vorderman and Richarda, there's a little interview with the Daily Telegraph talking about trying to do a around the world flight. I'm now going to leave this part of the story and go on to the fourth part of my talk, which is what you have all been waiting for, and that's the story of Richarda herself. And like all good stories, I'm going to go back to the very beginning again. So Richarda's story. I'm still very much at the beginning of my research, but this is what I've discovered to date. So Richarda was born Prudence Richarda Eveline, and that's E-V-E-L-E-E-N, Ralph, and she was born on the 22nd of November, 1923 in Ickleton, Cambridgeshire, which happens to be the village I've just moved to. And in between the two villages, I, I grew up. And in fact, her house where she was born is opposite my house. So this is Norman Hall, which is opposite the church, next to the village green. I can see it outside opposite my, one of my bedrooms. Uh, and this was taken in the 1920s, as you can see. It's on the Ickleton Society website, thank goodness. So I was able to take quite a lot of photos off them, but I have credited them. And uh, this would have been about the time when her father would have bought the house before it would have been the Red Cross Hospital, not only for Ickleton, but the surrounding area. Um, so I think it was in a pretty poor state when he bought it, so he would have had to refurbish it. And you can see there are two, two maids hanging out the window at the top um, and one just outside as well. And if we go on to the next slide, I'm hoping you'll see what it looks like today. So it's still completely recognisable, uh, but it's lovely. It's got beautiful grounds. It was in the open garden scheme a couple of years ago. And then I'm afraid we're going to have to go back to Cerdeval Cottage now. When Richarda, if we go back to that one, yeah. So when Richarda was seven years old, I don't know what happened to her family when she was seven years old but it's clear that there was some sort of reshuffling going on because uh, he sold, the father sold the freehold of Norman Hall and moved into this house, which is literally next door. Um, and there was a sell-off the following year of some furniture. So not all, it was clear it wasn't all of the furniture, but quite a lot of furniture was sold off in a, in a yard sale. And that was just before Richard's ninth birthday, the sell-off. Uh, and it also listed the doll's house, which I thought was a bit sad. I think at eight, it's a bit young to get rid of the doll's house myself, but that was listed amongst it. She's got two older sisters, but she's still only eight years old. It was called Mill House Cottage. For some strange reason, the father renamed it Cerdeval Cottage, and it obviously meant a lot to Richarda because she gave it as a middle name for one of her children. After they left, it returned to being called Millhouse Cottage, which is what it's called today. And if we see the next slide, I wasn't going to ask to go in the back because there's a little baby living in there. <laughs> so they, they want to be left alone. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what it's like from the front, uh, that bright pink colour. And it's been that bright pink colour for some time. So I'm assuming that it's not going to be too different from what it was now as well, because it's grade two listed, I think. So, um, Richarda was born in Ickleton, as I said, in 1923. Her parents here were Arthur Lionel Ralph and Avery Caroline Ralph, nay Tetley. And this was in the Yorkshire Evening Post on the 29th of January 1913, as I said there. And that was the wedding announcement. So, why was it in the Yorkshire Evening Post? Well, mum came from the Bradford area. Um, both sides of the family were essentially woolen merchants and they had a number of warehouses and buildings. And the one interesting fact I managed to pull was Peaky Blinders was filmed in and around that area 
and one of their buildings was used in Peaky Blinders. So I was quite excited about that fact, but there we are. Uh, on the other side, the Rouths, they're quite connected with Cambridge, but they also had quite a lot of strong military background as well. So her grandfather on the dad's side was a mathematician at Trinity College and a tutor. And he actually, actually beat James Clarkwell, is it James Clark Maxwell? In the tripos. Um, so quite, quite, quite academic on that side. I don't know why Richarda was given the first name Prudence. Uh, I've yet to talk to the family about that and see whether they know about that. But her middle name, Eveline, which I spelt for you earlier, very strange spelling. And actually the family questioned me about that and said, no, no, you've misspelt it. I did find that her maternal grandmother was Lillian Evelyn Tetley, nay law, and it's spelt in that way. I've checked the census records as well. I've checked the birth certificates. It's definitely spelt that way. So quite an unusual thing. So I'm pretty sure she got it from that grandmother. Now, why was she called Richarda? The family story was that Richarda's father had wanted a son. So when she was born, the third of three daughters, he gave her the name Richarda, a feminization of the name of Richard. However, as I said, I've looked at her family tree and I've discovered that Richarda's paternal great-grandmother was a lady named Richarda Airy, nay Smith, and she was married to the seventh astronomer royal, George Biddle Airy. He read mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, which is where he became interested in astronomy. And he was responsible for creating the legendary Airy Transit Circle Telescope, which defined the prime meridian at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, which I thought was quite exciting. Uh, and for those of you that may not know, the prime meridian is the zero reference for astronomical observations and the center of world time, and it is longitude zero degrees. So I was quite excited about finding that connection with this, this lady, uh, and I looked at, uh, at, at her in a little bit more detail, and I found that the Royal Museum's Greenwich created a YouTube video on the life of that first Richarda as part of the 2018 centenary celebration of some women being given the right to vote. And again, you can find that video if you search for Richarda Airy at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. And it's being presented by a female curator called Louise Devoy. So, uh, bell power, I would say. Going back to this first Richarda, her father was called Richard Smith. So this is where I think the name came from. So that would be Richard Morrow Tate's paternal great-great-grandfather. And he also came from Trinity College, Cambridge. He was a graduate and tutor there. And this included being the tutor to William Cavendish, the nephew of Georgina, the Duchess of Devonshire, who you may remember from the film The Duchess, uh, who was played by Keira Knightley. Now, Richard was lucky to have survived a nasty accident on the 14th of January, 1812. So that's when the first Richarda would have been about seven or eight years old. He went for a drive in a curricle in Holker Park in what was then Lancashire, now it's Cumbria. The curricle was being driven by his tutee, William Cavendish, who was due to become the Duke of Devonshire. He was the heir apparent when the horse bolted. Richard, together with William and another passenger, were thrown from the curricle. Uh, Richard only uh, survived with a broken rib, but sadly his duty did not. And Richard and his family continued to live and work in the Derbyshire area for the Dukes of Devonshire, and he's buried in Edensor, where he was a vicar. And if we move on to this slide here. So anyway, whatever the story behind Richard's name, it is an unusual, memorable one, I think you'll find. So this is Richard Smith. Um, it hangs in Hardwick Hall. We might remember best of Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall. Um, so it's owned by the National Trust now. And then there's his daughter, the first Richarda, Richarda Airy Nay Smith. If you go onto the National Portrait Gallery website and search for this photo, there are three up there. And the National Portrait Gallery very helpfully put a, a, a number of connections underneath Richarda. So you can see her and, and members of her family in photographs 
including Richarda's daughter, who was Richarda II's granny. So uh, another useful site I found. Um, so there we are. So that's what they looked like. So Richarda, like her two older sisters, went to school at the Perth School for Girls in Cambridge. And it was while there, according to her family, that she decided that she wanted to learn to fly. Maybe she was inspired by the 1930s golden age of female aviators. So some of them you may recognize. Jean Batten, the first female solo flight from England to New Zealand. Mildred Bruce, also known as Mrs. Victor Bruce, the first female solo flight around the world, but crossing the oceans by ship. Bessie Coleman, the revolutionary stunt flyer, and she was not only a sort of a, a gender breaker in, of her time, but she was also an indigenous Native American, so she also had to fight the discrimination on race as well. Amelia Earhart, which you all will have known, first female solo flight across the Atlantic from west to east, and most people think that she flew around the world uh, constantly hearing from people saying, no, wasn't it Amelia Earhart? No, she tried it, but she didn't make it. Amy Johnson, the first female solo flight from England to Australia, and Beryl Markham, the first female solo flight across the Atlantic from east to west. So a lot of female aviators during the 1930s, but perhaps not so many by the time Richarda was flying in the late 40s. It is clear that Richarda had a strong sense of her own character, even while still at school. And although she does not appear in the school magazine very often, and in fact her flight is literally a single line saying she'd started it at the back, and then later on a single line she'd finished it. So, you know, there were lots of articles about academics uh, in, in, the news, in, the, uh, in the magazines, but there's a woman who's just flown around the world and she's, she's a single sentence in both magazine editions. She does publish two articles, if we go on to the next slide. Uh, one when she was 14 years old, there in July 1938, and the second one in March 1939. So I had a query from Cambridge PPF to say, did we want to include her nickname, Dickie? But they thought, because they'd done some internet research as well, uh, that she only started using it after the flight. But as you can see from the school magazines, that she's already calling herself Dickie. She's playing around with the name, so that's D-I-C-K-I-E. And then by the time we get to March 39, she's settled on D-I-K-K-I, which is what she used for most of her life when she used the nickname Dickie. So the poem there, you probably can't read it, Future Perfect. Out in the garden, the sun was shining. The birds were twittering in the trees, laying eggs and singing songs. Were there any as happy as these? Take a message to my rod, you little gay bird on wings. Say I'll be back in five hours' time, fishing for trout and things. Then tell the water bailiff that I'm going on the spree. Tonight I'll be out poaching, but tell him he won't catch me. Now, I should explain that there was a trout farm in between the villages of Ickleton and Hinkston. I think it actually runs all the way to Duxford, and it was certainly until recently, if not still, run by the Cambridge Trout Club. And Richarda was not the only person to think about or perhaps do some poaching in that area. There's actually a gentleman who still lives in Ickleton called Derek Plum, who wrote a book, Little in Story, Recollections of a Wartime Childhood, 1937 to 1952. And he goes into great detail about how he and his friends went poaching for fish and trying to avoid the water bailiff. Uh, it's not that much long, long after when Richarda was, uh, was growing up, so it's probably, you know, five, five to ten years. There was definitely a crossover there. Uh, again, a, a fantastic read. Uh, he, he doesn't uh, hold back in any way about what he got up to as, a, as a, a young lad. So within a few years of leaving school in 1939, Richarda's personal life had changed dramatically. Obviously, there was the start of the Second World War, but... On the personal front, there was a lot of change for her too. So Richarda's eldest sister had married and left home in 1940. 
Her mother died very unexpectedly in Surdeval Cottage in 1941, and then her father died in early 1945. I picked her up in the Saffron Warden Weekly News on the 25th of April 1941, so just after her mother had died, and I saw that she'd passed her, her elementary typewriting. Um, so again, not really in, in accord with what the school were looking for. The school was completely all about Oxford and Cambridge and, and not secretarial skills, but there was definitely a, a segment of girls that wanted to do something a bit more practical with their lives, and Richarda and her sister were, were two of those. So just after her father died, the next change in her life came. She was aged 21 when she married Norman Robert Morrow Tate, who was aged 40. She'd actually met him when she was 17 years old uh, and become a close family friend. And that was on the 21st of July, 1945. He was a civil engineer. Uh, there is a rumor that he played at Wimbledon as well, but I can't, I can't verify that at the moment. So if anyone finds that, let me know. Her husband encouraged Richarda's interest in flying, and she became the first woman, as I said at the beginning, to obtain her civil flying license after the end of the Second World War. Now, it wasn't possible for civilians to fly during the Second World War for obvious reasons. And so licensing opened on the 1st of January 1946. The Cambridge Aero Club opened for licensing just six days later on the 7th of January after the Christmas break. And Richarda registered on that very first day with two other people. And she was the first person in the UK to qualify having registered on that very first day. Cambridge Aero Club have been teaching pilots to fly since 1930, and they're still a leading internationally renowned school. It's based at Cambridge City Airport, and as I said, it's also based at Duxford Imperial War Museum. Um, if you're not a flyer but just enjoy going up in the plane, they also do flying experiences as well. So during that first year of marriage, she was learning to fly, but she was also pregnant with her first daughter, and she carried on taking lessons for the majority of her pregnancy, but then there were complications, and she had to rest up for a month before she actually gave birth. She was already planning that round the world flight, but she obviously knew she had to give birth first before she, she actually got into the plane uh, to fly around the world. The other issue was that unlike some of the other earlier 1930s pilots, she needed a navigator. So similar to Amelia Earhart, who also had a navigator. And a family friend who was the same age as her uh, and happened to be reading geography at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge, was someone called Michael Townsend. Now, he was a mature student because like many men of his age, he'd been helping with the war effort. So he had been in the RAF. He had extensive experience of flying in all sorts of parts of the world. And having been in the RAF, he was very familiar with all the RAF bases as well as the civilian airports as well. So he was absolutely invaluable not only in being the navigator on the trip itself, but also helping to put together the route. Now, at this point, this is where the bureaucracy started. And I thought the bureaucracy at the beginning was pretty bad, but it, it got a lot worse as she went on through the flight, uh, partly because people didn't take her seriously because she was a woman, and partly because no one had done this before. No one had attempted this uh, at this time. And, uh, well, as you heard, the only person that attempted it still did the the bits over the ocean by boat rather than by flight. Uh, so they needed to find a route that they would be able to land on. Uh, and the first thing they did was go down to the embassies for the US and Russia to ask them for permission to land on their territories as well. Anything that was covered by the RAF, they could obviously do that through the UK. So they got to the US embassy and it was a yes. They were very excited about the trip and they said yes, uh, but Russia, literally said Niet, so there was no way that she could land in any territory belonging to Russia, which has proved a problem, but not insurmountable. The next problem was trying to find a plane. And this is another question I don't know the answer to, and that is how did she raise the funds for a plane? Did it come from inheritance? Both her parents had just recently died. Was it through her husband? Was it through support from friends and family and, and other sponsors, I don't know. 
She eventually chose a Percival Proctor Mark IV, which was originally used for communications during the Second World War. It had to be adapted because, as I, as I said, she needed to be able to get over the ocean without running out of fuel, um, which was going to prove to be very tricky given the, the, the planes that were available at the time that she could use. It also needed to be checked and the tests and calculations done to make sure that the fuel consumption was going to do that, but also that the, the plane was actually going to make it from post to post. Uh, and they also needed to get all the visas as well that, to get around the world. So all of that was being sorted out. She applied for petrol coupons because it was still rationing after the Second World War and they needed that to do the test flight and they were refused. So they had to do it completely on mathematical calculations and hope for the best. So they're completely reliant on the manufacturer saying, yes, yeah, it'll definitely get across the ocean. It will definitely consume this amount of oil, um, um, petrol. Um, you'll, be, you'll be totally fine. Uh, so they, they, they just did that. And, and as I said, hope for the best. Uh, remember that for later in the story. No test flight. So Richarda called her plane Thursday's child because she was born on a Thursday. And someone on the internet has said that maybe her daughter liked it as her nursery rhyme. And I'll certainly be asking the family whether that's true or whether that's something that someone's made up. And you may remember the old nursery rhyme. Monday's child is fair of face. Tuesday's child is full of grace. Wednesday's child is full of woe. Thursday's child has far to go. Friday's child is loving and giving. Saturday's child works hard for its living. But the child that is born on the Sabbath day is bonny and blithe and good and gay. And so that's why she chose the name Thursday's child. If we go on to the next slide. So this is Thursday's child, Percival Proctor 4. And this is one of the last photos of it before it crashed. So they got as far as Alaska in it, Elmendorf Air Base, Anchorage, Alaska, in November 1948. Bear in mind, it was supposed to take six to eight weeks from August, and that's a photograph in November. Uh, and then, as I said, there was a crash, so she eventually got next Thursday's child, which is a BT-13 Volte Valiant, which was also used in the Second World War as a, a, service, uh, a service plane. And she got that from a Dr. Lester Campbell, who was a dentist, but also happened to be a pilot and had a lot of rich friends. So they all clubbed together to buy it off Bob Hendricks, who's responsible for this photo. And I think that's Lester and Bob maybe in the plane there because she had to have a, a few flying lessons in that. She couldn't, couldn't just get in it and fly. She needed to get to know the plane as well. So those are the two planes. So moving on to the flight itself, as I said, six to eight weeks, I'll try and whip through it. And you'll hear as I tell you about it, where the delays came, why it took more than six to eight weeks, why it took a year and a day. So as I said, she set off on the 18th of August, 1948. She went from Cambridge to Croydon and then to Marseille. And if we go on to the next slide, for those of you that like pictures, you can see the route that she's taken. You can see Croydon's marked on there. And you can see how bizarre the route was. As I said, this is, this is because it was where she got permission to fly to uh, that she had to take this route. Now, these days, in order to complete a round-the-world flight, you have to cross the equator at least once. And you can see that she doesn't cross the equator at all. But at the time, those rules weren't in place. So it's, it's totally fine, as far as I'm concerned and as far as Richard was concerned at the time as well. And you'll see when we get to the US and Canada, there's some very odd things going on there, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So she was going this way, and then she came back to there. Yeah. Uh, now, I compiled this list partly from her memoirs, partly from the newspaper articles, because although there was negative publicity, there was actually quite a lot of positive publicity. And what was interesting was, despite the fact that it took a year and a day, they religiously 
said where she had reached and what problems she was having and what she was up to pretty much all the way through. They, they, I think they lost sort of interest in the USA, Canada bit, as, as you will hear. Um, but they were, it was pretty easy to sort of just marry up the newspaper records with what she had said had happened as well in her memoirs. Um, there's also a gentleman who runs Wingnet, uh, and he'd listed them all. But most of it was there, but there were some sort of shenanigans going on because they had to change the route here and there as well. Uh, I don't know whether you prefer to see the, the names or the, the picture up. Maybe I'll leave it with the, the, the names for now. If you want to see the picture again, just let me know. So the first hop over the ocean was to Marignan, France, which was near Marseille. It should have been an easy flight over. She'd been to France before. It was the only other country she'd been to outside of the UK before. Uh, but as she landed on the taxi strip, there was a huge bank of earth and a trench across the taxi strip. No one from air traffic control had told her. There was no signage at all. She hit it and the plane tipped nose down into that trench. So the, the flight was almost over before it had basically started. Uh, so that was the first delay. Nine days of repairs, but it was fine. They did manage to get the, the plane running again. So on the 28th of August, they left Marignan, France and went over to Lucca in Malta. And the other thing to bear in mind is it's not like today with lots of instruments and you can fly in the dark. They were trying to fly during the day. So that's the other reason for flying during the summertime. You've got long periods of light and the weather also tends to be better. So you've got the navigator, you've got your maps. You, you, it's like the old days before sat nav where you look at your map, you have to try and memorize it all and then get in the motorway and hope you get to the other end, uh, which is why she was so reliant on her navigator. And so most of the stops were intended fly during the day, rest up overnight, do any repairs first thing in the morning at 4.30, get back in and fly on to the next place. So on the 30th of August, she, um, she managed to reach Nicosia in Cyprus. And they then tried to fly to Baghdad, but they were told by Damascus Air Control that permission to land was being withdrawn. So they had to think about, what do we do? Do we go via Egypt? Do we go another route? Uh, and all the options were not available. The only option available was to fly to al Habinaya in Iraq, which is what they attempted to do on that 30th of August. But the plane wasn't playing ball, and there were technical issues. And they had to return halfway across back to Nicosia in Cyprus and do some more repairs. On the 1st of September, they did actually make it to al Habinaya, Iraq, and then on to Bahrain. And the following day, they went to Sharjah in the UAE. And they were supposed to go on to Karachi in the same day, but they left too late in the morning for some reason. And so they had to wait overnight in UAE before making it to Karachi in Pakistan. On the 5th of September, after a day break, they went on to New Delhi, as it then was, in India. And Richarda reminisces in her memoirs about the fact that her father, who was a military man, had spent time in India and wondered about you know, what his experiences might have been like at the time. And then on the 6th of September, they left New Delhi and went to Calcutta. And this was the first major delay. So nine days, but by comparison, they were stuck there for nine weeks. And that was because they worked out that the calculations that they made were not up to scratch. They were never going to make it across the ocean to Japan with the calculations and the fuel consumption that was happening at the time. They also discovered that when they landed, the plane sort of rotated slightly and had caused an undercarriage leg to essentially snap. It always been a little bit short, so, you know, some people have one leg shorter than the other. This aeroplane had one leg shorter than the other, and it snapped. And they had to order it in from the British Overseas Airways Corporation. And who knows how long that was going to take. 
In the meantime, they had this fuel consumption issue. What could they do? Well, they'd already adapted the plane to take on some extra fuel tanks. They needed to cannibalize another plane, so they thought, uh, to add even more fuel tanks. Um, so they ran around the area trying to find another plane. And luckily, because the Second World War had just finished, there was a Spitfire field nearby, so they thought they might cannibalize a, a Spitfire uh, to create an extra fuel tank, but that didn't work. So in the end, they did find some fuel tanks, but where to put them? There was no more room on the undercarriage to put the fuel tanks. So they decided to take out all the seats in the aeroplane and put the fuel tanks where the seats were and to use the fuel tanks as seats, and then create some sort of system to refuel midair from underneath their bottoms, essentially. Now, doing all of that is, it sounds a bit like sort of scrapyard, junk, junkyard challenge, but uh, they did manage to do it. They also had to get it past the insurance people, and they also had to get it past the aviation authorities as well to allow them to fly this with all these adaptions. And that's why it took nine weeks. It was, it was quite a, a traumatic experience for them, I'm sure. By this time, it's October. So well past the deadline of the 15th of September 1948 for them to reach Japan before bad weather hits, typhoons, etc., and losing light as well by that stage as well. And again, Richarda had to ask herself, am I going to continue with this flight? Can I do this, given all the problems to date and given the fact that they were well past that major cutoff. It wasn't a, just a cutoff for them in their minds. They were receiving letters from various authorities saying, you must not fly. The weather is not just predicted to be bad, it is now bad. Despite this, on the 23rd of October, they left Calcutta and went on to Mingaladon, Rangoon, Burma. On the 24th, they left Burma and went on to Vietnam and then straight on to Hong Kong in the same day. And on the 25th of October, they did cross over to Japan from Hong Kong to Okinawa. On the 26th of October, uh, they went from Okinawa in Japan to Itazuke. And they were told that if they continued to cross, they would not have any air sea rescue available. There was no, no one that was willing to go and rescue them if they ditched in the sea. That, that would be it. Nevertheless, they still carried on, and so on the 27th of October, they went from Itazuke, Japan, to Haneda in Tokyo, Japan. Now, Haneda at the time was a teeny tiny airport, just a couple of huts, but if you've ever been to Haneda, uh, it's, it's beautiful now. It's, it's huge. It's one of the, the major international airports now. And they had a few, few problems once they'd left Haneda. So, as I said, there's a gentleman on Wingnet who had put down all the, the stops. This is one stop that he didn't put down, but they definitely did stop. So they were on their way to Chitose from Haneda. And as they were flying towards Chitose, they were surrounded by a, a load of British Mustang planes uh, uh, who were taking, not taking no for an answer. And so they were forced to land because I think they were they thought they were enemy aircraft, essentially. So they had to land at uh, Mizawa and explain, no, they weren't enemy aircraft, and please, could they carry on? And they were allowed to carry on to Chitose. The next bit was somewhat complicated because it was right at the north of Japan. The weather was very bad by this stage, and they had been denied permission to land on Russian territory. So they wanted to land on the Kuril Islands, before they went on to Shemya, which is an island off Alaska, which is, was owned by the US. The US came forward and said, OK, we'll escort you from Japan over to Shemya with a B-17. But as they took off on the 3rd of November, it was incredibly foggy, light was failing, and their radio stopped working, which it had done throughout the flight, but it hadn't really been a problem up until that point uh, and they could hear the b-17 for a while uh, over the radio but then completely lost them and the b-17 clearly couldn't hear them 
And as they left the coastline of Japan, again, Richarda and her navigator had to make the decision, do we carry on? If we run out of fuel, that, that is it again. Uh, or do we return back to Japan and, and just call it a day? And they decided to carry on. They did actually pass over the Kuril Islands, which is probably what saved them, because then they were able to navigate off the Kuril Islands to go to Shemya. But the Russian instructions had actually been, don't go within 50 miles of the Kuril Islands, otherwise we'll shoot you down. So they weren't shot down, and they used it as a navigation point. They did manage to get to Shemya, and they landed with only five gallons remaining left of fuel. And they could see the B-17 on the landing strip below them, and it, in fact, it was just preparing to take off to find them. Uh, but they reached it just before the B-17 took off again. So they, they landed in Shemya fine. The following day, they left Shemya and made it to Alaska. And then uh, this is, it, 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 was, it seemed to be going well. I mean, they were on this, essentially the home leg by this stage having arrived at Alaska. So on the 13th of November, they were at Randall Field and then ended up at Elmendorf Air Base. So you remember that picture I showed you, almost the last photo of that, that Thursday's child. Then they had a week waiting for good weather. It was sub-zero temperatures, ice on the plane, very dark. But on the 21st of November, which was the day before Richarda's 25th birthday, they took off to go to Tanacross in Alaska. They didn't make it. They were forced to land on the Alcan Highway in the pitch dark and crashed into some trees and, and snow there. Luckily, the highway patrol found them fairly quickly and, and rescued them, but the plane was in a, a pretty poor shape. Richarda was also running low of funds by this time, because as you can imagine, you, you plan for a six to eight week trip, you take six to eight weeks worth of money, not several months worth of money. They did arrange for the, the, the aeroplane to be repaired and it was towed away on a, a lorry. But by the time it came back, it was actually in a worse state than when it had been taken away partly because of the journey on the lorry, it didn't do it any good, but also a number of trophy hunters had taken bits off the plane. Um, there was nothing for it. That was the end of Thursday's child. She had no way of getting home in that plane. She now had to find a second plane. So that was the first issue. The other issue, as I said, Michael was an undergraduate at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge, reading geography. Uh, it was supposed to take place over the summer holidays and he'd missed an entire term of studying and it was nearly Christmas. So he was asked by Cambridge to return in order to complete his degree, uh, and which is precisely what he did. On the 1st of December, he returned to the UK from Canada to complete his degree and to graduate in the Senate House as all students do eventually. Um, so she was not only planeless, she was also navigatorless, and she had no money at all. Her husband couldn't send her money because of the, 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 the transfer rules at the time as well. So it was one of the countries you couldn't just send money to. So what did she do? Well, she used her contacts. She networked like crazy. She did radio shows. She did press interviews but she also signed up as a nightclub singer in Edmonton in Canada. Um, she did whatever she could to try and raise funds and to raise awareness about her flight. Apparently she had a good soprano voice. There was one very sad incident though. She was singing in the nightclub and she had her handbag on the floor, which you know you should never do if you're in a nightclub. And uh, the money that she raised to that date was stolen by someone that just walked past. So she was back at square one again uh, quite early on. It wasn't until March of 1949 that she bumped into Dr. Lester Campbell, who I showed you on the earlier photograph. Uh, who put her in touch with Bob Hendricks, and between them, they, ra they raised $500, which back then was about £150, for that BT-13 faulty Valiant, which became next Thursday's child. And it wasn't until the 9th of April, 1949, that she was able to find a second navigator called Jack Ellis in Seattle. 
And this is when it became very complicated, which is why I need to look at the logbook, which I'm due to see on the 20th of April when I go down to see the family, as to what exactly happened at this point, because this is where the bureaucracy really overtook Richarda. Uh, by this time, you know, she was getting a lot of bad press. You know, why don't you go home and be a good mother and, and, and a good wife? Um, what's the point of this flight, etc.? Uh, her family, to their credit, kept responding via the press and were incredibly supportive, in including her husband and, and all the in-laws as well who were looking after her daughter at the time. So uh, her visa started running out was one of the issues. The other issue was that she was told that she couldn't register the plane because she wasn't a US citizen and it was a US plane. And then there were the random additions to the plane that she'd had to do to next Thursday's child as well that were not approved by customs officials. So there was this bizarre scenario where she went from Seattle to Vancouver, Vancouver to Edmonton, to Fort St. George, St. John in Canada, to Fort Nelson in Canada, uh, and then to Watson Lake in Canada. Uh, and then from there, she made her way back to Tanner Cross, which is where she was aiming to get to the, the, the site crash. And so by the 20th of April, I think, she went from Watson Lake in Canada to Whitehorse Airport in Canada to Snag Airfield in Canada. And then she circled over the crash site to say, absolutely, I've started from the same place to carry on my journey. And then she backtracked again all the way, Whitehorse, Watson Lake and Fort Nelson uh, and landed. And then she was there until the 24th of April when she went back to Edmonton, where she'd been the nightclub singer. Then she was intending to go across to the US and then make the final leg back via Greenland and Iceland. So sometime in May, um, she went to Minneapolis and then on to Chicago. And then on the 21st of May, this was when she was grounded by Chicago, Chicago Customs Office because they said she'd improperly registered the plane and the extra fuel tank they said was unsafe. She then somehow managed to make it out of Chicago to St. Clair County and then to Toronto, uh, back in Canada again. And this is where she fell out with her second navigator. I think she, she said something to his wife and it was all downhill from there. And so Jack went back to Seattle and she had to fly the plane by herself without a navigator back to the US. And at that point, she wrote to Michael and said, mm, I don't suppose you could come back again. And luckily he had graduated and so he was free to come back. Um, but because he was no longer a member of the RAF, he had to pay for his own flight back. So he flew to Montreal and then made his way down to the US to meet Richarda. And there's a slightly poignant um, moment um, just before Michael arrives back in the US on the 1st of June, 1949, when Richarda's mother had died eight years earlier. And she says in her memoirs, you know, I remember my mother dying and it's a, it's a moment to sort of check what I'm doing in my life and to, to remember her as well. And she apparently did that every year. Michael arrived back on the 29th of June, 1949. So time is ticking on. They were still trying desperately to raise funds. So they were still trying to do radio shows. Uh, they attempted to attend the International Light Plane Rally in Grey Rocks Inn. Uh, and flew to it but couldn't find it, so they had to fly back again, so they didn't make any money. <laughs> and then on the 11th of July, 1949, they were grounded again due to registration issues. The, it wasn't until the 22nd of July that she was able to persuade Canada to let her leave to go to the US uh, on the condition that she never returned to Canada again. So off she went to Burlington, USA again, only to be told that the visa that had been issued in Canada for to, to come to the US had expired and the only way to renew that visa was to go back to Canada. <laughs> you can imagine what happened in Canada. So on the 31st of July, she goes back to Canada uh, and then she decides she's just going to do a runner. She's just going to take off without permission. 
And so she goes on to Banffor in the US and then Old Town in the US and then Old Town in the US. Unfortunately, she does have to go back to Canada, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador, Canada, which is the last point to jump off to Greenland. And she was hoping at that point that she was so far north that no officials were going to catch up with her. And she made the mistake of staying the night there rather than pushing on to Greenland, by which time the officials did catch up with her. Uh, so that was on the 3rd of August, as I said. Um, and not only was she refused uh, permission on, obviously, the, the grounds that I've already talked to you about, but they also came up with the reason that they would not permit anyone to fly across the Atlantic in a single engine plane. I don't know the reason for that, but that's, that's what they said. They did manage to persuade them that they could leave 10 days later on the 13th of August, and they finally left Canada and the US and made it to Greenland. Uh, they had a, a few days sightseeing there and going for walks um, across sort of ice flows, etc., cetera, um, mountain streams, etc. And on the 17th of August, they left Greenland, went to Iceland. The following day, they left Iceland and made it to Prestwick in Scotland. And then finally, a year and a day later, they left Scotland and made it back to Croydon. Now, you'll have seen that I haven't got a huge number of photos and I've told you to go and look for them. And that's because it's quite difficult to get permission uh, and quite expensive to get permission from various places like Alamy and Top Photo, etc. Um, we're going to show you a video now. And for those of the people who are going to watch this online, you'll be able to copy and paste that that link and watch it for yourselves. So after the flight, Richard returned home to married life. Uh, and in spring in the following year, in 1950, she gave birth to her son. However, she was also in the process of a divorce from her first husband. And shortly afterwards, married her navigator, Michael Townsend. <laughs> yeah. On the 27th of March, 1951, in Bury St. Edmunds. Her first husband also remarried at the end of the same year. So, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, some of the press coverage, as I said, both during her flight and certainly during her divorce was very negative. Um, there were calls for her to return home, as I said, to be a wife and mother by some of the press, despite her family being supportive of her. And I would like to say that it was a sign of the times that she was described as the flying housewife and the flying mother but as we all know, gender equality is still very much a live issue for some of us. So Richarda died in 1982, and it was only after her death that Michael Townsend discovered that she had written a book about her flight, which she had not finished. I think it was in the loft of the house. It stopped in June 1949, so just before that final leg of the journey back. Michael assumed that she stopped because of that negative press coverage of her divorce, which she thought made it impossible to publish in the circumstances. So Michael, together with his co-author, Norman Ellison, finished Richarda's book and published it in 2001. Sadly, just after Norman Ellison had died, in fact, uh, the co-author. It is called Thursday's Child, the story of the first flight around the world by a woman pilot. It is out of print, but you may be able to pick up a copy on eBay or on an online secondhand bookshop. And there are also copies available in both the University Library and Clare College Library. It really gives a good idea of what Richard was like. It's all written in the first person. It's not the most sophisticated um, writing, but it really, as I said, gives a flavor of her character. You can really hear her. And there are lots of details and descriptions of the people she met and the countries she visited. So it's not too technical. Even I could read it, it was fine. Um, so really, if you can get hold of it to read it, it's a very quick read as well. You can, you can do it in a day, really. So what next for Richarda? Well, we are gearing up for the official unveiling of the blue plaque on Monday the 19th of August, 2024. So on the 75th anniversary of the completion of the flight, there is a new miniature white gladiolus, which will be launched by the Dutch bulb growers, Thijs Nolks and Rude Birdby, and has been given the name Thursday's Child. 
Uh, you probably didn't spot in the video, but when she lands at Croydon, she's handed a huge bunch of gladioli by her, hus her first husband. Um, and I thought it might be a nice idea to try and find a gladiolus uh, to be, to be honoured with Richarda's sort of achievement. I happened to go to the Downing College tulip launch and I pegged Rude Burby, the, who found me a, a, a bulb grower to grow a gladiolus. I mean, it was, wasn't grown specially for it because these things take years in the making, but he happened to have a gladiolus that was ready to be named and he was willing to name Thursday's child after her aeroplane. I did approach the British Gladioli Association, uh, but it's a much smaller uh, market these days rather than Holland. And so they, they've been kept in the loop as well. And in fact, the, the president of the Gladioli Society, I spoke to his wife, who's, who's the secretary of the society, and she remembered Richarda. So another person that remembered Richarda. And why did she remember Richarda? Because of the bunch of Gladioli that she was handed. So that was quite a nice, nice conversation I had on the telephone with her, and they were very enthusiastic about it. So uh, that's what's happening. Um, the, you, as, as I said, uh, there will be an official press release in due course, uh, as happens with all blue plaques. And um, hopefully it will also include how to buy the gladioli, which I'm dying to buy to put in my garden as well. And marshals have very kindly agreed to host the ceremony. So you remember I was fishing around earlier and thinking about where the unveiling ceremony would be best placed. But marshals, obviously, with Cambridge Air Raid Club, um, have very kindly stepped forward for that. And I'll be working very closely with Cambridge PPF, Marshalls, Cambridge Aero Club and Clare College in the lead up to the blue plaque unveiling ceremony. So thank you very much. And say I do tend to go off down a lot of rabbit holes which you could probably tell from my random facts throughout the talk uh, this is an amazing story but having been in Ickleton for all of six months essentially they have an amazing history society and my next project is another lady who lived in Ickleton who won the 1955 Monte Carlo rally <laughs> So I'm just looking for a sailor now, and then I'll have the full set. <laughs> yeah. I think this is something I need to talk to the family about. I do know that she retired to a quieter area of East Anglia. Um, she did actually do some sailing, in fact, um, and I, I think she, did, was she a painter as well. She might have been a painter as well. She did maintain her licence until 1960, uh, so she did keep on flying. But yes, I think she did have to lead a quiet life. I think the, the press coverage was just, it, it, I mean, I've only you know, touched the, the tip of it, but it was pretty horrific. Yeah. Yes, that without social media. But you had, you know, daily newspapers at the time. You had, yeah. you know, morning and evening. It was, everyone was talking about it. Yeah. And when will the installed? It will be at St Regis. So even though it's a new build, uh, it will be at St Regis. Yeah, yeah. As I said, it would be lovely to have a blue plaque trail. I don't know if someone else has done it, but... Um, it, we, we should definitely do one. As I said, I did, the, I did the Dinky Doors tour in the middle of lockdown, obviously legally, uh, and I, the number of people I found doing exactly the same thing at five in the morning because none of us could sleep. Uh, it would be lovely to have a blue plaque trail and to just go around Cambridge that way. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, we've got to get a bus now. 
Uh, train. train. Yes, I didn't realise I'd be talking for that long. I did, <laughs> I did have a go at doing the talk. I did a little practice run a couple of times, but uh, it didn't go on that long before. <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's fine. I'll get the train, it's fine. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you.